creativity to me is a thought process that's unique and novel. Innovation is the creation of something that has realized value for someone else. And so one is the thought process, one is the creation of something. The power of different is the catalyst that sits before both of those. You can't go and be creative if you don't have some point of difference. Welcome to episode 166 of Be The Drop, a weekly interview podcast sharing stories from people who inspire and motivate others to help you learn how to tell your story. I'm Amelia Veal, Director at Narrative Marketing and firm believer in the superpower of storytelling. It can seem difficult to create a point of difference for your business. There are learned perspectives and attitudes that prevent us from seeing outside traditional viewpoints. However, if we allow ourselves to be open to new ideas and ways of thinking, great success can be achieved through creativity in business. Different is nothing to be afraid of as Finbar O'Hanlon emanates in his daily life as a musician and creative entrepreneur working with corporate brands and other entrepreneurs. His career experience with composing and technology has led him to speak to a variety of audiences and play in an array of bands, including The Cure and Limp Biscuit. In today's episode of Be The Drop, different is the new conservative as Finbar explains risk and tears down the current paradigm of creativity in business. His experience in dealing with both the creative and corporate world gives him great insight into blending of knowledge between the two. This is Finbar's version of Be The Drop. If you're looking to keep up to date with the latest podcasting trends, I wholeheartedly recommend subscribing to Pod News. I've included the links in the show notes or head to podnews.net in your web browser. Finbar, thank you so much for joining me for our next episode of Be The Drop. Great to be here. So we're in Melbourne, your hometown, yep. and you've brought along your item of significance, which mm-hmm. is something that's going to introduce us to you and mm-hmm. get us to know a little bit of your backstory before we launch into the world of Finbar. So my item of significance is a guitar pick. That's my pick of destiny, a bit like the Tenacious D movie. But quite interestingly, uh, I'm a musician, I'm a guitar player, but this, in terms of significance, isn't got to to do with guitar per se. This to me is an artifact of something that helps push a trajectory into a style of music or a style of playing. And to me, music is a language that you never ever finish learning. It doesn't, it's always evolving. And to me, it's the way I look at life. It's, uh, I look at things in artifacts and I look for value-based artifacts and how I can assemble those in different ways to create different structures of value. It goes with me everywhere. I use it to play music. I sometimes look at it and I just think about the different fragments of things in our life, on our journey of life. It's that how do I detect the things of value because I'm constantly trying to find the signal in the noise. Well, what a beautiful story to introduce all of the multiple levels that is Finbar because I I think that's one of the things that I've definitely noticed about you is there is a lot of different layers, a lot of different things going on. And I think you actually describe it as a purveyor of difference. Is that right? Well, I say to people I've worked hard my whole life to be indescribable. And that actually is something that most people are challenged with because as a product or a brand, which I am in a sense with, with certain things that I do, uh, people expect you to be able to instantly tell them the value so they know what to buy. But in a way, a lot of the stuff that I do and the, the, the work that I do in helping people understand the value of different and understand how to see through a different lens is actually, it's, it's sending a filter in a way because my image, the things that I say, are it's its a way to see whether people are ready to digest or to take that journey. Because if they're not, they're not going to get past that in the first place. So it's a little pressure test in the first place. So for me, I don't know why you would want to sit behind a title or a piece of metadata that says, this is who I am and I'm happy about it, but I've got this other life beyond me, which that doesn't really represent me, but it does in a work environment. I think we're, as a society, evolving beyond that. Mm, yeah, and it is exciting. But there is also something a little bit daunting or sort of uncomfortable about different and embracing difference. But you said you, you work with people to help them understand the value of Correct. difference. Yeah. So from your perspective then, what is that value? What's the key value around embracing difference? Well, the, the, the first thing is if you want a competitive advantage, I often say to people, name one person you aspire to be that's done everything the same as everyone else. 
every single person that you aspire to be at some stage has done something different. We're sort of programmed in a social environment to accept that, no, we should be good little wheels in a cog, which is fine if that's what you're happy with. It's just that at least for me and for certain people who are looking for something different, it doesn't, what I'm talking about doesn't apply to everyone. It just applies to people who are looking for something different. And what I say to them is that you need to start to embrace this thing whereby we think that we better not step out the box, but we really want to. And then when we see other people that are actually successful at doing it, we really try and read their books and figure out what the top tips are to try and get that magic little thing. But often it's just starting to understand that these social things that you're being taught, you can't step outside that, but you can't be different until you're really different. It's like there's stepping stones and it's, it's not that complicated. So what I try and do is hold people's hand through that journey of different. It's just the basic boot camp, simple processes that get you to pressure test and test it. So you go, actually, this isn't so challenging. It's just that curtain I wasn't supposed to look behind. It's actually not that scary. It's just that someone's going to help me go behind there. So what I try and do is help the transition between starting to understand that it's scary, the word different. It's only scary because of the association you have with it being scary, because that's what you're being told is to not be different. Don't stand out. What happens if, well, you might get criticized or this might happen. It's like, well, I've been so blessed in my life because I've, I guess I've always been sort of weird and different that I couldn't mold myself into the system. So I thought, well, you know what? I might as well just start just being myself. And it was like quite liberating. Absolutely. I think there is a liberation in that. And I've spoken before about how when I started my business narrative marketing, I created a brand set that made me look professional. And, you know, I thought represented my company well, but it didn't fit me. And so then we redid the branding and we've used the superhero colors and we've embraced storytelling and it's me and it really fits and and people can resonate and the right people resonate. Well, to ask you a question too, when it doesn't fit and you're living that non-authentic sort of thing, when the pressures hit you, which it always does, it gets really, really hard because you really start questioning, what am I doing this for? It's not even really me. But when it really is you, you tend to weather the storm a lot better, you know. Mm. And so from a business perspective, you talked about getting a competitive advantage. What are some of the things that you work with businesses in this space to help them, you know, really see how their brand is different, but how do they become unique? And what are some of those key okay. tools you so, provide? So um, obviously the, the basic one that most people talk about and most people sort of have a little bit of a grasp on is design thinking. There's this concept of design, which is – You put yourself right in the customer's eyes first. Who's going to use this? Who's going to digest it? So it's really starting to not think about you and what you want. It's about who are the people who are going to engage with your products. That's the first thing. And you'd be surprised at how many businesses will stand up and go, this is what I do, blah, blah, blah. And I get them to go for a very simple thing, which is don't tell me what you do. Tell me the value you create for people. It makes you think about the people you're talking to and what's the value. And then... What you do is subliminal to that. It's a process to get you to that value. Best way to describe it in an analogy is think of Lego. They've built a Lego building. I like to come in in a workshop and facilitate them through smashing that piece of Lego into little Lego bits again. And then through processes, we raise to the top which of those bits of Lego are valuable. Then we've actually reduced the number of bits. And then we assemble them in different ways, plug this into that. And through that course, they're actually going through a process of re-looking at their governance, their business structure, their operations, their products by this process. Now, whether it actually ends up as right or wrong isn't actually the result. If it comes out as something really valuable, that's great. But in one session, it's teaching them a process of being able to strip the signal away from the noise, figure out where value is, and that's prototyping them by assembling it in different ways. So it was looking at their business through a different lens. And you'll find it's quite a, a challenge to do it. In a lot of the organizations I work with, a lot of the problems are the same. It's just that it's not the same to them because it's their world. And by pulling them out of their world, it forces them to see through a different lens. It, people talk about outside the box, but by running a parallel universe strategy and saying, right, you have to think of your business now in a biological sense. And I guide them through that. It, what it does, it forces them out of thinking themselves. So they have to, and it's a great way to just take them into a different world and they're already outside the box. So then we start to work from outside box in. So it's an outside in perspective rather than inside out perspective. Oh, I love it. 
I really do love it. I work with a lot of boards and a lot of the work I work with boards is I say, I will guarantee you one thing, 100%, that by the end of the time we've worked together, you're going to be able to see or act on a work with something a little bit different than what you had. This isn't about me coming in and saying, because I'm different, I'm going to throw different ideas at you. And I think that people get challenged with that. Like, oh, we're going to get this guy in and he's going to come up with different ideas. It's not my I, it's not my process to come up with ideas. My, my process is to try and help them learn how to use the power of different rather than me being a guy that just comes in and throws different ideas. Everyone's got ideas. It's just the process of how you validate them to see whether that, those ideas are actually usable or not. You know what mm. I mean? And I, that's a really important thing because ideas and creativity, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful process. I love it. But if you can't validate that, if you can't explain where it's going to provide value, then it will fall over, in, you know, in a business context. And, and yeah. look, to be honest, I find it interesting because I'm a creative. I'm a musician, artist. I became an inventor and I learned through taking my inventions to market, building companies, raising capital, taking them public, all of the stuff involved from the idea to a, to a public listed entity from being CEO and chair that I had to learn processes. And I find a lot of creative people are so caught up in the creativity that they don't think about the processes behind the creativity. They're just into the creativity. You have to have processes, but the processes don't have to define the creativity. It's how they work together. And it's a really interesting mix. Without knowing a, a process to validate ideas, they're just ideas. And if they're different ideas, a lot of people don't understand that if you have an idea and you present a piece of evidence to a board, that board becomes informed and then they have to act on an informed decision. So knowing the difference between when you should present information and when you shouldn't present information is a key part of strategy. And a lot of people don't understand the nuances involved in, well, I've got this idea, but this idea is only part of a puzzle. And that's the artifact, the guitar pick, is to being able to figure out if you have an opinion, where is the value of that opinion going to end up? And who else are involved in making that work? And how do you make sure it all aligns? So it is a puzzle, right? We have a piece of the puzzle and we meet people who have to have another piece of the puzzle. So if we know what to look for and how to look for it, then these things come in the way. So to me, it might sound weird, but that's just the way I look at it. And I'm, I'm always looking at analogies and the guitar picks a great reference for me because I'm always looking at, we're storytelling now, but we're communicating and we're trying to communicate value. And then we're trying to find an audience that understands that value. Or we're trying to cut out the noise in the sea of noise. It's an interesting jambalaya of uh, information. Yeah. And you touched on something that, you know, is a shared passion of ours and that is the storytelling and the power of how that can really cut through the noise, you know, and how that can help us navigate to a point of providing value. Yeah. People always ask me, what's one of the biggest tips? How do you raise capital? How do you do this? And I go, well, you've got to understand everything I've invented didn't exist. And I raised money and it helped me get on the journey. The one thing I learned to do was to tell a story. It was the most important thing. People would ask me for a business plan. I go, no. And they go, well, you want me to invest in your company? You don't have a business plan. I go, I didn't say I didn't have a business plan. I'm just not going to show it to you. This is part of the story. They go, why wouldn't you show it to me? I go, because you're going to go to the end page. You're going to look at how much my cash burden is. Then you're going to tell me that I'm spending too much money. And they go, right. And I go, I'll show you that once you understand the journey we're going on, the addressable market, uh, the value it creates. All of that is the story, right? How you present in a meeting. I would have a guy in a suit next to me all the time in America because I would present as the mad scientist, technical guy, even though I could talk to the business stuffs, but I wanted to make sure that they would go, that guy's weird. But the other guy in the suit that's validating is the val you know so there's a whole theatrics to telling the story and it's to me it was it's critical and it's one of the most overlooked things quite interesting and they're doing the same as everyone else there's no different in there and it is that unique story that is going to create the emotional connection that is going to then allow people to take the next step and go okay so what is the context if everyone listening to this goes on and sees a movie trailer and then goes and connects with a movie or a series or something like that they've bought into the story the trailer has told them enough to get them into the, the thing well a startup is exactly the same you've got to connect with employees, investors, people who are going to have commercial contracts. It's the, I don't know why people don't see this and don't come promote with the same vigor that I believe it should be because you get the right people on board believing in that where that North Star lies, then you're going to get the empowerment of all their skills to be able to actually help crystallize it rather than I need to know all this stuff myself. If you know how to tell a story, look at Steve Jobs, look at some of these other great business leaders, you know? Yeah, and they did. And I like that because you referenced the North Star and, you know, that's that 
point of unity. That's where this story is driving us to. And if you want people to get on that connected point, then you have to actually articulate the story that demonstrates where that North Star is. Yeah, well, it's like I look at it like everyone has a story. And everyone has something that they're aspirational about. When your North Star aligns with other people who go, I want that North Star too, and you can do it in, in a great way, well, then you start to sort of get the power of co-creation rather than just an employee. And it starts to become this journey where it becomes a mutual journey. Talk about outside and being different. One of the tools I use in some workshops is I study a cult. And some of these organizations are like, what? Are you, what? You're going to study a cult? They go, yeah, we're going, to, we're going to study a cult. Let's pick a cult. And I go, why are we studying a cult? And they're like, because it's very confronting. And I go, because you've got to look beyond studying cult. A cult is the best example of marketing you've ever seen in your life. It's people are giving away their houses and their families to join something that they can't validate because someone's got a great story. I'm not saying being a cult's great. I'm studying the architecture of storytelling and a ideology or a, some sort of belief system that people will give that stuff away. That's quite powerful. I'm not saying that you go and do that, but it's just interesting. Some of these things are challenging, but when I when people get challenged, I ask them, why are you being challenged by this? Have you ever asked that question? Oh, no, no that's, you can't do that. Okay. Have you ever wondered why you're getting upset about that? Where did that come from? Because it's just a word. It's just an association. You've got some inbuilt association. Well, that's fine, but it's interesting to find out because a lot of those things are the things that are stopping you from really accelerating. At least that's what I find. Mm. I say that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I mean, yeah. You know. No, look, and the, and the power of cult, it is because that it's all based on incredible storytelling. And some of these people will go into places and move beyond, you know, their own personal beliefs, like what they would have valued as right or wrong and do a set of behavior that doesn't even necessarily sit with who they were because they bought, buy in so much to the story. When people look at that, they go, oh, and they get all upset about it. You go, okay, well, I'm looking at it through a different lens. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not like you're saying, it's. A, this is a great example of storytelling. It's showing, demonstrating the power, the power of, of storytelling. storytelling and it's being used in a bad way. Correct. But it's still But there's the a power, power there. Yeah. And, and is there something to be learned from that power? You know, I'm sitting here thinking, um, you know, obviously this is an audio podcast, so listeners can't see, but I'll include some pictures on social media and I do encourage listeners to make Make sure you go and have a look because as Finbar's talking about going and speaking with boards and working with corporate clients, I'm, I must admit I am having a, a little bit of a chuckle because you do not fit that mould at all, which, you know, obviously you've said and it's an important part of, of who you are and, and how you do things. But it's great. Why I, I think I'm getting to work with more and more boards is the understanding that the profile of risk is changing because in the past risk would be if we do something that could be risky, let's just not do it. The problem is now – Organizations are being disrupted. They don't know how digital transformation is going to change their own future. So whilst on one hand, they've got a whole heap of risk they can identify with workforce and legal things, they have no idea about digital transformation or technology. And so when I say to them, if you're risk adverse, tell me the top three companies that might disrupt you in the next three months. They have no idea. And I go, oh, great. So how's that managing risk? And so a lot of boards have structures or subcommittees where they'll have professionals, consultants, law firms, feeding information or intelligence into the board that can help them make an informed decision, yet they don't have experienced innovators who have innovated and done it and actually taken companies out and built products and patented things and gone through all of that to be able to say, this is what you need to know about how digital transformation might affect your life. So a subcommittee, I believe heavily in this idea of having innovation subcommittees of experienced innovators that come in to provide board intelligence so boards can make a better informed decision. And that's commentary that's resonating with boards. And I'm not talking about some big consulting firm who's got experts who've come out of academia that studied innovation. I'm talking about people who have actually invented things or taken things. And sure, I know it's self-serving by me saying that, but there are a lot of people in this country that are very smart that could be utilized to help mobilize boards and to make better informed decisions. Mm. And, and I like that, you know, you're not talking about just tech disruption and because, you know, dis disruption is such a, a you know, it's yeah. become a bit of a cliched yeah, word. Sure. You're talking about 
risk management. Correct. I love how you re- you really understand the board language and the context of companies and organisation and, and what drives them because using risk management, that is a key driver for a board's role. That's part 100%. of their job description. 100%. But when you talk about innovation and disruption, they might go, oh, that's a a nice to have, but, you know, oh, that's probably out there. I have a definition around the difference between creativity and innovation because I talk to a lot of people. I say, well, what does innovation mean to you? And they just really can't explain it. So creativity to me is a thought process that's unique and novel. Innovation is the creation of something that has realized value for someone else. And so one is the thought process, one is the creation of something. The power of different is the catalyst that sits before both of those. You can't go and be creative if you don't have some point of difference. I've been lucky my whole life. I've had investors that have helped me develop this right from an early age. But we need to educate and help people understand where this power and difference is and how they can start on the path to learning it. You don't just become a big muscle bound freak in one day. I'm big on that. How do we promote education of of the power of different rather run away from it? Mm. And is that something you think we need to be re-looking at the education from, you know, primary school, like our, our schooling education to teach how to think differently? Like, you know, how does that work? Well, for me, soft skills of the future, emotional intelligence, the resilience quick decision making, cooperation, internal strength, problem solving, seeing disparate patterns in data. It's it's these sort of things that I think that we need to start cultivating. Creativity stems from the ability to see disparate patterns, the things that don't fit together. And so it's that, how do you see the patterns? The guitar pick is a reference of an artifact. Tomb Raider is an artifact. Where are the artifacts and how do we assemble them to validate quickly our ideas, to see opportunities? And I just don't think that teaching people on a logic-based syllabus of if you remember this, you're going to be really good, is getting them to see things through a different changing environment. No, and it's interesting because as you're talking then, I could feel the musician in you because that's around combining different sounds and bringing different instruments together, but also pushing that and, you know, how you can create a song that uses different sounds to, to move people, to yeah. make them feel and think. So, you know, that musical creative process is very much about... Well, it is. I, I say to people, it's like hieroglyphics. They go, what? And I go, well, if you look at music on a piece of paper, it's cryptography. When I did my my TED talk, they make you write out your pitch and then they have to review it. And I don't work like that. I just say, look, I just make it up. The last one I did, the organizer allowed me to do this. But for me, I promote art of improvisation in business. So when you're a musician to improvise, you've got to know your stuff. In business, when you say, I'm going to make it up, people presume that you don't know what you're talking about. I did a little video. It's called being an expert at not being an expert. I teach experts to go beyond being expert where they can improvise. Mm. So they can look at the data, live data and mix it with their knowledge to then refactor something that's actually relevant to right at this point in time rather than something that they've learned. Oh, look, and honestly, anyone who's studied improvisation like as an actor will know there's a huge amount of skill in that. You know, I used to teach effective communication and so I'd give someone, okay, here's a word, tell me a story on this word, you've got 60 seconds, go. And they didn't get to the point where they could actually do that until we developed a whole lot of skills that enable you to then do that on the spot. I mean, you just ask somebody to present on a topic that they really know and that they've got weeks to prepare and they still might be nervous. Nervous. Yeah, 100%. You know, if you're asking improvisation, that's like a whole nother level again and 100% agree. But, but it's, it's interesting how a lot of people in business go, you can't just make it up. You don't even know what you're talking. You know what I mean? There's an instant association and that that is a direct representation of the association with what people are thinking different. That's fearful. Why is it fearful? Because I've been told all my life that different's not what I shouldn't do. How come you all turn up to work in the same suit and you'll work over, over time to try and get noticed when you could just go and change your outfit? Oh, well, I could get fired. Well, how do you know? Have you tried it? <laughs> but not to, not to try and say to people out there to go and do that, but I'm just, it's just quite fascinating that people have these associations with different, with improvisation, and these are skills of the future. I just don't think people are talking about. Fantastic. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Finn. In conclusion, could you share with me your Be The Drop tip? To inspire and motivate action, what I do is I, I find a North Star that is super, super aspirational, something that I know a lot of people are going to want to aspire to. And then I find next level down of people who can connect to that story, who can re-inspire others. It's very much that study occult methodology. With businesses I've had in America, I've got 
big movie stars and rock stars attached to it on advisory committees and because I've got them, all these other people attached to it. And so it's about how do I tell a story that's world changing? Even if even if it is a, a product, it, being able to tell the world changing story is a thing that gets it mobilizes people around it. And so that's the art of storytelling. And it takes work and practice at architecture, but that's where that power of storytelling really comes in. Fantastic. Thank you so much. No worries. My pleasure. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Be The Drop. Don't forget to subscribe in order to ensure you never miss out on one of our weekly episodes. Be The Drop is produced by Narrative Marketing, where we believe that stories connect individuals and that powerful storytelling can positively impact the world. To unleash your storytelling superpower, visit narrativemarketing.com.au or check out our social links in the show notes. To contact me directly with any specific comments you have, you can email me via amelia at narrativemarketing.com.au. And don't forget that whilst a task or challenge may seem overwhelming, a waterfall begins with one drop and look what comes from that.